1946, moviegoers got their first glimpse of an astonishing new machine. Are people becoming obsolete? The giant electronic brain has started cogitating at the University of Pennsylvania. It's made of vacuum tubes, like your radio, and it can add up a column of figures a yard long in a second. It's the world's first electronic computer. Right now, it's solving mathematical problems for the U.S. Army, but who knows? Someday a machine like this may check up on your income tax. The computer was called ENIAC. And in 1946, few people thought that such machines had a future outside the scientific laboratory. Costing the equivalent of three million dollars, it calculated so quickly that people predicted that only a handful of computers would ever be needed. Six in America and three in England. The very idea that there could ever be a computer business was ridiculed. People thought that the market for the machines was just for a few, or a few dozen at most, and the market would saturate, and then who would want any more? It's like you were trying to make a business of making atom smashers. Uh, maybe you could make a little money on one or two, but uh, then what would you do for an encore? Though built for the military, ENIAC was the brainchild of two young civilians, J. Presler Eckert and John Morkley. In 1946, they left the university and set out to start a business selling computers. They found little enthusiasm for their idea. Generally speaking, when we talk to businessmen and banks, financial institutions at that time, they took a very dim view of all this and, and they really didn't uh, have enough insight to see into the future far enough to believe anything like this could work. And my father signed a note at the bank for $25,000 which helped us get started until we could get going. With this modest sum, Presper Eckert and John Morkley launched the world's first commercial computer company. This small Philadelphia firm constituted the entire world computer industry in 1946. The first order of business for the two entrepreneurs was to find a customer for their product. But who would want to buy such a complex and delicate scientific machine? When Eckert and Mockley proposed to make a commercial venture out of building and selling electronic computers, a lot of people were very skeptical. And they raised a number of very interesting objections. The first one was that the machine was made out of large numbers of vacuum tubes. And these tubes were prone to burning out. In fact, uh, if you could keep one of these uh, machines running for a few hours before a vacuum tube burned out, you considered that great. But a worse problem was the machine's complexity. To make a computer do what you wanted was no easy task. You almost required an understanding of very advanced mathematics or logic to even get the computer to add two numbers together. And people felt that such a talent was so rare in the world that it didn't matter if you could mass produce the computers, you would never find enough people who had that skill to make them useful. Undaunted, Eckert and Morkley looked for a customer with a need so desperate that they'd be willing to take a gamble on the new technology. And they found it here. The US Census Bureau employed hundreds of clerks to process population data. They were drowning in records, with enough paper to fill a football field. They had a census coming up in a few years, and the time it took to process the census was getting longer and longer. And, it was, and they are mandated by Congress to get the census done in a certain length of time because elections are based upon it. And they were fearful that in the following election they wouldn't get done in time without something better than they had. The technology used for record keeping and accounting had been around since the turn of the century. Armies of clerks slaved away, punching data onto punch cards and then processing that information on other machines, which sorted the cards, added numbers on the cards and printed out results. But this whole tedious process and the clerks who operated it could be replaced by one single computer. Or so Eckert and Morkley tried to convince the Census Bureau. We thought it was magic. We didn't, didn't believe it was really feasible to begin with. As we talked more and more with them, we came to believe that they knew what they were talking about and that they had already demonstrated uh, some important aspects of it in ENIAC. In September 1946, the first contract for a commercial computer was signed 
for the price of $350,270 and not a penny more. This footage, taken with John Morkley's home camera, gives an idea of the optimistic spirit in which this young company set out to found a new industry. They named their computer Univac, for Universal Automatic Computer. But within a few months, Eckert and Morkley realized they had vastly underestimated the time and money their pioneering work would require. The company soon fell badly behind schedule and seriously into debt. It was a pattern the two inventors would repeat time and time again. They were terrific engineers and designers. They were not terrific business people. They had problems and uh, they gave us estimates and unfortunately we Unfortunately for them, in a sense, we made a contract with them, a fixed price contract to produce a Univac, which ties us down legally. And uh, that wasn't enough money for them to produce a Univac, nor was the time schedule enough. Uh, these are not criticisms. When you're doing developmental work like this, this is what uh, you expect to run into. But they hadn't anticipated enough of this kind of a problem. Alone in their field, Eckert and Morkley were inventing the future, and there were many unknowns. They spent considerable resources developing the electronic equivalent of boxes of paper files, storage devices like magnetic tape, and tanks full of mercury. Charting this new territory took its toll on the company. After a year in business, the Eckert Morkley Computer Company was struggling to stay alive. They needed more investors, or at the very least, orders with money up front to tide them over. And time was not on their side. Three and a half thousand miles away in London, Britain's computer industry was just beginning. It was one of the most extraordinary episodes in computer history. The J. Lyons Company was famous at the time for its string of tea shops and the celebrated Lyons Corner Houses. It was also a large-scale food manufacturer and distributor, employing more than 30,000 people and handling 40,000 orders a day. Strange as it seems, it was this company, famous for tea and cakes, which would start Britain's commercial computer industry. You had in the senior management of the office in Lyons some extremely far-sighted people with a, a considerable mathematical background. So it wasn't any surprise, really, that when they heard about these giant brains in the British newspapers, they thought to themselves, this is something we must investigate. After the war, Lyons was desperate for a better way to streamline its growing operation and keep track of its thousands of employees and products. What Lyons needed was a computer. But in 1947, there was no computer to buy in London. So this innovative company decided to build its own. To learn how, they asked for help from Cambridge University, where a team led by Maurice Wilkes was at work on a computer. Wilkes was one of the few people who agreed with Eckert and Morkley's vision that computers had a place outside the laboratory, and he gladly accepted the challenge. They gave us a certain sum of money, I've forgotten how much it was, and the services of uh, a technician, or I suppose I would now call him an engineer, uh, to work with us. Well, he was a member of their staff, he'd been in the RAF, I believe, he'd come back after the war, and I think he told me once he was working on a most interesting project, um, a coin-operated machine for delivering sizz sizzling hot sausages. Thus began the British commercial computer industry. By the end of 1951, the work of 400 clerks had been taken over by Lyons Electronic Office, appropriately nicknamed Leo. Once Leo was up and running, its programmers began thinking up some novel tasks for it. In those days, the managers of the tea shops used to send in their orders for the next day. And sometimes it was necessary to alter the order um, according to the weather. Uh, they wrote a program that would take these orders, and if the weather were going to turn hot, it would reduce the amount of steak and kidney pudding and increase the amount of salads and that sort of thing. 
Very interesting program. Lyons Computer also took in work from other companies who soon wanted their own and asked Lyons to build them. So in 1954, the Lyons Company, purveyors of tea and pastries, added a new product line, computers. The path of the American computer industry was not as smooth. By 1948, Eckert and Morkley had been in business two years and were still far behind schedule. While Presper Eckert worked feverishly building the Census Bureau's Univac, John Morkley searched for more customers to relieve their financial crisis. There were other contracts under negotiation, important Defence Department contracts. But inexplicably, negotiations always broke down. Apparently the President and I now agree on the necessity of getting rid of communists. We apparently disagree only... In the anti-communist hysteria, Eckert and Morkley's wartime service to their country was forgotten. The company they had founded now became a victim of the witch hunt. Those were the days of McCarthyism in Washington. And their idea was to pull your security clearance and not even tell you why. So contracts you had lined up, customers you had lined up, who were going to invest money in your projects, just quietly pulled out and wouldn't tell you why. But this is why. In the early 1940s, John Morkley came under FBI suspicion. He'd attended a meeting of a scientific organization that, unknown to him, had a communist affiliation. This single event prevented him from obtaining security clearances needed to work on defense projects. It would take nearly a decade for John Morkley to clear his name, and he carried the resentment with him until his death in 1980. But in 1948, when things looked hopeless for Eckert and Morkley's company, help came from a most unlikely source. Riders up! And they're off! The American Totalizator Company, makers of the mechanical equipment that calculated odds and displayed the winnings at racetracks, was headed by Harry Strauss. A man of vision, Strauss foresaw the day when computers might replace his totalizator equipment. To hedge his bets, Strauss purchased a 40% interest in Eckert Morkley, injecting desperately needed funds into the company. For the next year, the Eckert Morkley Computer Company underwent rapid expansion. The staff increased from 40 to 134. But this prosperity would be short-lived. Eckert and Morkley's last best hope vanished when Harry Strauss died in a plane crash in October 1949. One month later, Strauss's partners notified Eckert and Morkley they wanted out of the computer business. When they just wanted to get out of something which they regarded as a financial loss, they also didn't think it was going to work. They didn't have any faith in it as Mr. Strauss did. And so they encouraged us to get somebody else to buy the uh, idea out as soon as possible. Without backing, the Eckert Morkley Computer Company sank deeper into debt. The pair, who had started off with such high hopes, were forced to sell out to Remington Rand. Remington Rand sold a variety of products, including typewriters, filing cabinets, and punched card tabulating machines. But to the general public, they were best known for their electric shavers. James Rand, president of Remington Rand, liked to speculate in new ventures. He also wanted to gain a foothold in this new field of electronics. The brand name Univac from now on would belong not to Eckert and Morkley, but to Remington Rand. Under Remington Rand's label, the first Univac was finally delivered to the US Census Bureau, almost a year late and considerably over budget. It was America's first commercially built computer, yet it only rated a back page story, little noticed by the general public. But within a year, the name Univac would be on the lips of millions of Americans, thanks to a brilliant public relations move by Remington Rand. 
Good evening, everyone. This is Walter Cronkite speaking to you from CBS Television Election Headquarters here in New York City. CBS were convinced that to win the lion's share of the election night audience, what they needed was a Univac computer in studio to forecast the result. Turn to that miracle of the modern age, the electronic brain Univac and uh, Charles Collingwood. This is the face of a Univac. A Univac is a fabulous electronic machine which we have borrowed to help us uh, predict this election from the basis of the early returns as they come in. Univac is going to try to predict the winner for us just as early as we can possibly get the returns in. For the first time, a computer was about to predict the outcome of an election. First of all, let me tell you a little bit about the theory of this. This is not a joke or a trick. It's an experiment. We think it's going to work. We don't know. We hope it'll work. At any rate, for the last... At 8 o'clock, Collingwood asked Univac to type out its prediction. Can you tell us uh, what your prediction is now on the basis of the returns that we've had so far? Have you got a prediction for us, Univac? I don't know. I think that Univac is probably an honest machine, a good deal more honest than a lot of commentators who are working, and he doesn't think he's got a, enough to tell us anything about yet. But we'll be back with him later in the evening. Now back to Walter What Trump. Collingwood didn't know was that Univac did have something to say, and this was it. Just before CBS went on the air, Univac predicted Eisenhower would beat Stevenson by a landslide. The problem was, no one believed it. The machine turned out this answer that they didn't believe. The polls were telling them that it was going to be about a 50-50 election, and we were telling them it's a landslide with only 5% of the vote. And they couldn't believe that you could predict the thing as accurately as we did, which was within a few percent, with only 5% of the vote. So everybody was thrown into total confusion. Uh, the Republic. Excuse me. The McCarthy... Uh, uh, but the confusion the wouldn't last long. long. Votes were now pouring in for Eisenhower. Even before all the polls closed, it was clear that Univac had been right all along. General Eisenhower was winning by the largest landslide in the nation's history. After midnight, CBS confessed to the public what had happened you saw as the prediction as more votes came in the odds came back and it was obviously evident that we should have had nerve enough to believe the machine in the first place it was right we were wrong next year we'll believe it the next day the headline said it all the whole world had taken notice of univac It wasn't long before Univac began appearing in the movies. I like one of these machines where you push a button and it just does what you want it to do. I'm not a robot, I'm people. And I quit. While Univac captured the attention of Hollywood, it was at last catching the eye of its intended customers. By the end of 1953, there were three Univacs installed and more orders were coming in. And there seemed to be no competition in sight, not even from Remington Rand's closest rival. Today, the name IBM is synonymous with computers. But in the 1940s, the company showed little interest in these new machines. IBM seemed content to stay with the punched card tabulating equipment that it had pioneered at the turn of the century. For 50 years, IBM had grown rich on a technology that would soon be rendered obsolete by electronic computers. At first, they didn't recognize it. But when the Census Bureau, who used hundreds of IBM's tabulators, ordered their Univac, one IBM vice president became alarmed, Tom Watson, Jr. I'll never forget how I felt about the Eckert Monthly contract in the Census Bureau. I felt a sense of great panic and uh, went back to Washington, to New York City from Washington and uh, had a late night conference saying, look, we do, this is the beginning of the end for the IBM company unless we recognize it and do something about it. 
Thomas Watson, Jr. knew that IBM could lose everything to computers, but nothing was done at IBM without his father's approval, and Mr. Watson, Sr. saw no commercial future in these newfangled machines. But when I'd say, well, look, Dad, if we don't take this business, somebody else will take it for us because the, we're now being pushed by the market. We're market-driven. We're not driving the market. The market is driving us. We ought to try to get ahead of it. Some stormy sessions getting there, but at the end of the road, he was agreeable. When, in 1951, IBM finally took its first steps into the computer age, some five years after Eckert and Morkley had begun building Univac, it was with a scientific computer rather than a commercial one. However, the big new market wasn't in selling computers to scientists, but to businesses, and Univac was slowly stealing away IBM's business customers. Within two years, the younger Watson had a free hand in the company. Thomas Watson Sr. finally stepped aside in favor of his son, who vowed to focus all his energy beating Univac. And this was the inexpensive machine with which he launched his attack in 1953. Technologically, it seemed no match for the Univac. Designed to run in conjunction with IBM's conventional punch card equipment, it was slow. But Watson had a secret weapon, which would compensate for any crudeness in the technology. The IBM sales force, his dad, had left him. Thomas Watson Sr. had had a ferocious approach to sales and a superb understanding of salesmen. He rewarded them with high commissions, pushed them with quotas, inspired them with speeches, educated them in classrooms, and punished them if they didn't toe the line. And it worked. Well, he expected uh, at least the moon and perhaps the sun from his salesmen. He wanted a, a good sales job, and he wanted a lot of orders because we grew with orders, and he also used to say, look, uh, the salesman who m is the man who makes things happen in the United States. Nothing happens until something is sold. Then it's manufactured, it's delivered, it's used, but nothing happens. And so the salesman, in his mind, was a sort of a, an American hero, and perhaps very high on the list of American heroes. It was these heroes of IBM who convinced hundreds of ordinary businessmen to buy IBM's 650 computer. Orders started pouring in. Within a year, IBM had sold almost a thousand of them and soared past Remington Rand's Univac to become the largest computer company in the world. <laughs> IBM's sudden new dominance threatened the fledgling British industry, too. In the early 50s, a handful of manufacturers, from Ferranti to Lyons, fought over what few customers there were. At this business efficiency exhibition, the British tabulator company, Britain's equivalent of IBM, was showing its wares. The firm's one and only computer salesman tried to attract attention by programming it to play noughts and crosses. Later, all the major British companies would merge to take on IBM. We can't expect to be able to outproduce uh, a large American company, but there's no reason why we can't outthink them. And a great deal of thought was needed back in the 50s if manufacturers on both sides of the Atlantic were to honor the promise of their advertisements. Computers, the advertising claim, were the key to the future. But in their enthusiasm, they failed to mention one thing. In the late 1950s, the computer manufacturers' advertisements and proposals were rosy. And we who were making those promises turned out to be liars. We didn't know we were, but we were. The problem was software, software development. Writing software, the programs that tell the computer what to do, turned out to cost two, three, even four times the price of the machine itself. In fact, this problem of software development grew so severe that it really threatened the further growth of the computer industry. Computers costing thousands of dollars a month would sit idle while programmers struggled to talk the computer's arcane language. We BPX to 10D, AOR 10... Well, this AOR gets us into a BSN 11. Don't we want a BSN 12 instead? 
Unfortunately for programmers, computers cannot execute programs written in English. They require a special language of their own. The computer only understands the language of binary, and it's really a code, not a language. Binary simply means zeros and ones, analogous to an electric light switch, which is either on or off. If one simply looks at an example of what the binary code would have to be for 5 times 7 plus 3, one can see that it's incredibly difficult to write that kind of thing accurately. In the first place, it's tedious to write it, and in the second place, it's almost impossible to do it correctly. Programmers developed alphabetic codes which were easier than binary. But still, programming was difficult and tedious, and few people were attracted to it. The shortage of programmers could, in the worst case, have caused the growth of the computer industry to come to a dead halt, because there were so few programmers. Without programmers, you don't have programs, that is to say, software, and without software, the computer is useless. You might just as well have an automobile without a driver. It doesn't go anywhere. It just sits there. This crisis could only be solved by making programming easier to do. If people couldn't talk to computers in binary, perhaps computers could be made to understand a language a bit closer to normal English. The first so-called high-level language that became significantly used was Fortran. Scientists and mathematicians found it relatively easy because it allowed them to write equations in the way they were used to. Businessmen who didn't often write equations didn't find Fortran much help. They needed their own language, one that could handle letters as well as numbers and could process files of data. For that, you needed a different kind of language, and that led to the development of COBOL, which stands for Common Business Oriented Language. COBOL was very English oriented, that is to say, you wrote the programs in a language which was certainly not identical to English, but at least looked like English when you read it and wrote it. COBOL was a revelation, easy to use and to find errors. And with the help of another piece of software called a compiler, the high-level program is automatically translated back to the binary code that the computer understands. With the programming problem solved, at least in principle, the stage was set for an endless variety of new uses for computers in all walks of life. Operating around the clock, this communication center receives and processes all incoming requests for police service. Computers could now track police cars or pedigree bulls. In Kansas City, Missouri, the American Hereford Association dedicated a new electronic computer. On hand to push the starting switch, America's grand champion Hereford Bull, HR Silver Image 70. This hoof switch started a new IBM 1401 computer that will keep track of all registered Herefords. Silver Image thus became the first animal ever to trace his own ancestry and appeared quite interested in the results. But most computers were found in administrative offices where armies of clerks were beginning to disappear, replaced by a single computer. Computers also started showing up in factories, controlling machines and processes that once required hundreds of human hands. As computers intruded more and more into the workplace, fears were raised that increased automation might make millions of workers obsolete. Automation is a young, new word, heavy with promise and with problems. As a matter of fact, several people have suggested to us that it's a little too heavy for a Sunday afternoon in June. Could be. We shall see. For a time, deep passions were aroused. The crime is great in this city. Well, can my four children go hungry because of automation? Or what will I have to do? What do I propose to do if they do go hungry? What chance uh, or choice is left to me but to turn to crime because of automation? And it's true that this plan will cause a layoff of some of our loyal workers. However, it's a necessity to do it to be competitive in today's industry. Even Hollywood took up the issue. Yeah, he's up on the roof feeding the pigeons. No, you know what he's doing here. What? He's trying to replace us all with a mechanical brain. 
He's under special assignment to his eye to see if Emmerich can be adapted to this apartment. That means the end of us all. Peg, Peg, calm down. No machine can do our job. <laughs> That's what they said in payroll. Movies like Desk Set revealed the conflicting emotions computers stirred up in society. While many people viewed them with fear and disdain, others thought they represented progress, the future, a relief from tedious tasks. Not surprisingly, the staunchest advocates for computers were the computer manufacturers, like IBM's Tom Watson, Jr. A lot of people call these machines giant brains, and whenever I hear, hear the term, it makes me shudder. Because they are giant, giant tools, they're certainly not giant brains. And if you have good tools, you're upgrading them, not downgrading them. That was a common argument, that computers replaced jobs nobody wanted. Certainly it was true at the Bank of America, which employed almost 2,500 bookkeepers just to process personal checking accounts. Every day, they sorted and recorded more than 9 million checks, the perfect job for a computer. This is Los Angeles, and I'm Ronald Reagan. May I hear, please? In 1961, in one of his lesser roles, Ronald Reagan was the commercial spokesman for General Electric, who made the bank's computer. The Bank of America has called this new system Electronic Recording Method of Accounting or by the more familiar and friendlier term, Firma. A competent, experienced bookkeeper using conventional mechanical equipment is expected to do the sorting and posting for about 250 accounts an hour. Firma can sort and post 550 accounts a minute. Magnetic characters printed on the checks could be read automatically by machines. This was the key to Irma's high speed and account information was transferred to reels of magnetic tape. The bank was delighted. Irma was more than 100 times faster than the best human bookkeeper and virtually error-free. Now, we think that Irma displaced thousands of bookkeepers. Well, we created other jobs within the bank because of Irma. I mean, somebody had to handle all the reports coming back from the Irma centers. Somebody had to prepare the work going to the Irma centers. There were other jobs that were created that weren't quite as boring and tedious as being a bookkeeper. Computers like Irma did change the nature of people's work, and some jobs were eliminated. But these were prosperous times in Britain and America. The fear of computers replacing human workers would slowly subside as employment continued to rise. One industry that was experiencing unprecedented growth during the 1950s was manufacturing the component which made the computer possible, the valve. Computers gobbled up valves as fast as the manufacturers could turn them out. But the boom was about to come to an abrupt end. most people, the transistor meant small portable radios. But the transistor itself was a tiny electronic component, which some call the most important invention of the 20th century. Its inventors, Walter Bratain, John Bardeen and William Shockley, won the Nobel Prize in 1956, in the same year as the first transistorized computer went into production. The valve, or vacuum tube, had been the main switching element in the computer circuit it was realized that the transistor could play precisely the same role. The transistor was much, much smaller than vac a vacuum tube, for example, perhaps uh, a 50th the size. It, it weighed about 100 times less than a vacuum tube. It gave off no heat. Uh, it required a fraction of the electrical power that a vacuum tube needed. What that meant for engineers designing computers is that with transistors, they could now think in terms of designing computers that were much, much more complex and powerful than anybody would have dreamed of designing using vacuum tube technology. But as soon as they did that, you see, they ran into this problem of how do you wire them all together? You had this incredible tangle of wiring. The Atlas, built at Manchester in 1962, was the ultimate transistorized computer. At the time, the most powerful computer in the world, 
it could handle a million instructions every second. Connecting up the thousands of components created a wiring nightmare. This problem, which multiplied as the number of components increased, became known as the tyranny of numbers. Until it was solved, computers more powerful than the Atlas were hard to envisage. And yet a solution to the tyranny of numbers problem was already available. This was one of the earliest integrated circuits, a device that would change the world. The idea was first suggested by Geoffrey Dummer, a British radar engineer in the early 50s. But the scientists at Fairchild Semiconductor in California, and in particular Robert Noyce, produced the first manufacturable integrated circuit, the chip. Essentially, it was made from just one piece of silicon, a material fabricated from common sand. Chemically altering small sections of the silicon made transistors, the cone-shaped structures. Chemically treating other areas of the silicon created other electronic components. Then to wire everything together in a circuit, a layer of metal was evaporated on top of the structure. The tyranny of numbers problem in principle had been solved. No longer was it necessary to hand-wire large numbers of electronic components together. One manufacturing process made the components and wired them together. And as an added bonus, the circuitry of a whole board could now be reduced to the size of a fingernail. The integrated circuit had been announced in 1959. But surprisingly, computer firms showed little interest in this new electronic marvel. For some, the integrated circuit was just too radical a change. But for most, it was just too expensive. Brilliant though the advance was, there seemed to be no takers. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out, of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. This is the BBC's own sense. Here is the news. All Moscow is waiting to give a hero's welcome to the world's first spaceman, Major Gagarin of the Soviet Air Force. Major Gagarin After the Russians' triumph in sending the first man into space, Nothing less than a man on the moon would restore American pride. Yuri Gagarin's epic voyage prompted Kennedy's challenge to his nation's scientists and engineers. It also ensured that the integrated circuit would become a component of computers. If a spacecraft was to land a man on the moon, it would need an onboard computer to maneuver it into orbit. But how could they put a computer into a spacecraft when it could barely hold its three astronauts? Transistorized computers, like the Atlas, weighed over 20 tons and contained miles of wire. Extremely sensitive to heat and vibration, they were hardly devices to be put aboard a spaceship. NASA scientists knew a small, lightweight computer could only be built from integrated circuits, and they were willing to pay any price. So was the Pentagon. A cold war between two superpowers demanded weapons of unprecedented sophistication. By the early 1960s, computers made from integrated circuits were needed to guide the Minuteman II missiles, the submarine-launched Polaris missiles, and Air Force jets. Working around the clock, electronics firms discovered the true genius of the integrated circuit. Unlike the old hand-wired transistor circuits, ICs could be mass-produced and prices plummeted. That's a very interesting thing about this technology. I think it's what has really made it so powerful. I call it a violation of Murphy's Law. In this situation, uh, by making things smaller, everything gets better simultaneously. The electronics become higher performance, uh, they dissipate less power, uh, they become a lot more reliable, particularly in complex systems.
But most importantly, they become cheaper. I compared it at one time to the printing press, that uh, in this case, you could design it once and then reproduce it many, many times very, very inexpensively compared to, let us say, having the monks write down the book and copy it by hand, which was sort of the way we were building electronics at that time. We were taking all of the elements and then putting them together. Um, with the integrated circuit, we get the chance of doing the whole thing identically, time after time. At the start of the 60s, the first commercially produced integrated circuit, with less than 10 transistors and other components, cost $1,000. In the years ahead, ICs underwent enormous change. Every year, the number of components on an integrated circuit doubled. Within a decade, the cost of an IC had dropped to pennies. Nothing like this had ever happened in the history of any commercial product. My uh, favorite analogy is if the auto industry had moved at the same speed as our industry, uh, your car today would uh, cruise comfortably at a million miles an hour, probably get a half a million miles per gallon of gasoline. But it would be cheaper to throw away your Rolls Royce and buy a new one and park it downtown for the evening. As the electronics industry grew, this California region was transformed from peach orchards to the electronics capital of the world, aptly named Silicon Valley. With 300 electronics firms in a 30 square mile area, even the streets bear witness to the growing importance of this new industry. Eight years after John Kennedy's challenge, NASA's onboard computer, built from integrated circuits, was completed. At the time, it was the smallest computer in the world. The success of the mission and the lives of its astronauts depended on that tiny computer. 72 hours after blast-off, the craft would lose contact with control. After that, it would be up to the computer. It was the ultimate test of the integrated circuit's reliability. Apollo 11, this is Houston. You are go for TLI, or? Using the computer, the astronauts would have to maneuver into orbit on the dark side of the moon, out of contact with mission control. And we've had lost of signal as Apollo 11 goes behind the moon. Now they were on their own, their fate resting on the ability of the onboard computer to ease them into orbit. With the whole world watching, Apollo 11 returned into view and completed its historic mission. Tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. This remarkable achievement was celebrated by millions of Americans. Among them, a generation of children who had never known a world without space travel or computers. Eckert and Morkley's vision that computers had a commercial future had turned out to be right. Nevertheless, a growing number of young people felt that they were excluded from participating in the computer revolution. They began to dream of a day when they would own their own computers and use them not just for calculating, but for anything they chose. This was the thing we had grown up to love. When I was in, in high school, I told my father that someday, back then the mini computer with 4K of RAM cost as much as a house. I told my father I've decided that someday I'm going to have an apartment instead of a house, and I'm going to buy myself a computer. I'm going to be the one person that owns a computer. Steve Wozniak and his partner Steve Jobs would help write the next chapter of the computer revolution, putting the power of the computer into the hands of millions of people.